Can you guess what's turning 150 and just landed on the must-visit list for 2017? Stay tuned to find out if you're right. Welcome to Vacation Mavens, a family travel podcast with ideas for your next vacation and tips to get you out the door. Here are your hosts, Kim from Stuffed Suitcase and Tamara from We Three Travel. So, Kim, you go to Canada a lot, eh? Yeah, that's right. (laughs) I do. I married a Canadian and his family is still in Canada, so we go up there quite a bit, actually. And over here in the Northeast, we head up to Canada quite a bit, too. That's right. It's an easy jaunt for you guys. How far is it to the border from what's the nearest border crossing for you guys? Well, probably like heading towards Montreal. It took us about five to six hours to get to the border. And then, of course, there's like an hour wait at the border. But I would say about that far. So it's definitely drivable. We've driven to Montreal. We've driven to Niagara Falls and Toronto. And we've also driven to Quebec City. Nice. You did. You've done quite a bit over there. You know, it's kind of funny that Canada is a huge country. And Paul actually hasn't visited practically any of the Eastern Canadian provinces area. So he's a full... His family is from Edmonton, Alberta, and um, all of his Canadian youth was spent mostly in the western part of the country and a little bit of the north uh, because his dad was a missionary pilot in Canada, actually. So, Well, now that Canada is having their 150th birthday and they've been named Lonely Planet's top country to visit in 2017, maybe he'll have more of an incentive to explore more of Canada. Yeah, he would love that. His biggest request from me right now is to go to Churchill, Manitoba. Oh, me too. And I know that's your thing, too. He loves polar bears. He always has. And he, of course, would love to see the northern lights and just kind of experience that famous area of Canada. So we've spent some time, uh, before we had our girls, we spent some time over in PEI and Nova Scotia a little bit. But, yeah, we definitely need to check out the eastern My mom wants to go up to um PEI in Nova Scotia. So if you, every year I think about like, should I do that trip with her? And uh, it is, it's a long way to drive to get there for us. Like it is doable, but it's definitely long because even just getting all the way up through Maine can take like eight hours mm-hmm. or more and then go on from there. But it's something we've thought about. And last year, I think two, yeah, 2015, we were in Quebec City for Winter Carnival, which is amazing. And then we were in Montreal for Labor Day. And then we went to actually Vancouver for in November of last year. So we've actually, yeah, we've hit a lot. Um, But I want to explore, of course, more of British Columbia because it just looks so beautiful. I want to go to the national parks. I I once drove up the coast from Vancouver up to Whistler, but I really want to go over to Vancouver Island. Yeah, Like there's just so much. And someday I really, really want to take the um, the Rocky Mountaineer, the train that goes through the Rockies. That just looks incredible. We want to do that really bad. It is definitely pricey, though, but it's on our to-do list. And that's the area we drive all the time. So I guess sort of Uh, we look at the fact that we can drive it. So Um, just open up your, you know, the sunroof and just pretend you're on that glass dome train. Exactly. (laughs) I thought of that sometimes. It doesn't quite have the same experiential feel, I don't (laughs) think so. But it's interesting that you brought up the whole uh, national parks because there are quite a few beautiful ones. And that's one of the things that I think is the big perk of 2017 for visitors to Canada. It's that they are allowing all visitors to enter their national parks for free. Yeah, which you think this year was our 100th anniversary in the U.S. And they still had their few national park free days, you know, which was like April and August. Um, There's a few others scattered throughout the year. And then, of course, they have like the the fourth grader free program. But still, to have the whole year where all the parks were free, I mean, that's a big incentive. It is. They're being pretty hospitable, really trying to get people to go up there. And again, like the dollar, a lot of times when we travel, we really like it because our dollar goes far. So Yeah, I remember the, the first few times I went to Canada, it was, it was the opposite. Yeah. And, uh, so now, yeah, it's not good. I know we've talked about it before. Not so good for the Canadians, but good for us. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Well, Churchill is definitely like on my other to-do list. It's like you definitely want to do British Columbia. I would kind of like to get to some of – I'd actually even like to do 
like like New Brunswick and like mm-hmm. the Bay of Fundy area. Yeah. That's what um, we did. But Churchill would probably be tops. But that's such an expensive trip. And every year in November, I guess, is like the prime time. And I always follow a lot of like photographers and bloggers that invited on media trips. And I see their pictures and I'm like, oh, I want to go, I want to go. But I looked into it and it was something like $7,500 a person or something. It's almost like going to Antarctica. I mean, maybe wow. not that bad, but. It's like a package deal that they arrange for you or something through a tour company. Is that what you're. That's what I had found. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's other options, but to go in those, of course, you want to go into one of those vehicles, you right. know, that goes out. You're not going to go <laughs> for a walk. Protects you from the, the polar, polar bears. bears. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a good thing. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I definitely, I, I definitely want to do that. And we do get up to British Columbia quite a bit. We've done Vancouver Island. We've done. There's a really great. I have a post about it, but there's a really great ferry run that goes from Seattle up to Victoria. So it's called the um, Victoria Clipper. And it's it's a great way to, you know, it's kind of a high speed boat. So you can get up there pretty quickly. And it's a pretty comfortable trip. And the experience of riding the boat is fun, too. So if you ever get cheap airfare out here to Seattle, you could always do something like that, head up to Victoria and explore Vancouver Island, and then come back down to Seattle to fly back out. So that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, and here I would say one of the advantages why why people like to go to Quebec is that you get that feel of Europe, you know, because um, especially yeah, French speaking, um, very multicultural, but there's it it has the history, you know, everything feels. um, I think yeah, Montreal is celebrating what their 350th birthday this year, so like it's definitely an old city, and like I loved the old city in Quebec City. Ah, it's just it's beautiful. Um, and of course we were there in the winter, so I'd really like to go back in the summer, but I, yeah, I really like that area a lot. Yeah. That's the area that Paul and I want to get to is kind of Montreal, Quebec city and, um, experience, you know, quite a bit of his, you know, heritage. So. Hey, so weren't your girls just asking to go to like another country where they speak another language? Like maybe instead of going to Europe, you just Bring them to Montreal and Quebec City. Absolutely. Yeah, my youngest, well, Mia loves, she want, really wants to learn French because her cousins speak French because they're in French immersion in Edmonton. Uh-huh. So my two oldest nieces are, you know, fluent in French. And uh, it's it's quite cool. And I wish that we had those kind of programs in the States. It really bothers me. I've been trying to find foreign language programs for them to get involved in, and I can't find anything. So it's kind of disappointing. But uh, we should, we should definitely do that because those kind of trips, she, I was amazed at how much she loved it. So maybe she's going to become a UN speaker or something later in life. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Speaking of the Bay of Fundy, that was the trip we did. Uh, we actually flew, we got a good airfare deal into Halifax, Nova Scotia. So we flew into Nova Scotia. We rented a car and drove over to New Brunswick where we stayed in a B and B house. that was actually a Mountie. It was a Canadian Mounties house oh. and they had a room that we stayed in. And then we drove across, across the big Confederation bridge that runs across over to PEI and spent the time in PEI and kind of reminiscing about Anne of Green Gables area. So it was definitely a great, great trip. So, and I would love to go back and also go to Newfoundland and Labrador because they have kind of those um, great fishing villages with the colorful houses that you see a lot right. of times in kind of, I think maybe Ireland and some of the Scandinavian countries. Yeah. Well, I think that Canada has a lot to offer. And of course, it's a huge country, but we are going to talk to Claudia from the travelingmom.ca. And she is going to share all about, you know, her insights into her country. She's based in Vancouver, but she's explored, you know, all over. So she's got some great tips to help you plan your trip to Canada. So I can't wait to talk to her. Sounds good. So today we're here with Claudia Leroy, and she's a freelance travel writer and blogger at thetravelingmom.ca because she lives in Vancouver, Canada with her husband and her two teenage boys. Claudia has been traveling since she was a baby and is passionate about educating kids through the travel experience. And her blog, The Traveling Mom, is a modern mom's guide to family travel. So welcome, Claudia. Thank you so much, ladies. It's such a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's nice to be interviewing someone who's on, you know, my side of the country, sort of, and the world. (laughs) Yay, go West Coast. Yeah, West Coast all the way. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you guys are pretty close between 
Seattle, Vancouver, but also Kim, you're often traveling up to Canada for family visits, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah you've got some fabulous uh, connect connections. That's right. We just had some, <laughs> I just played host to some of them. They got two Thanksgivings this year. That's, oh, how nice. <laughs> that's lovely. <laughs> so before we start talking about your wonderful country, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, how old your kids are, and kind of how you got into writing about family travel? Well, sure. Um as you mentioned, I live in Vancouver, British Columbia. I've been out here for almost 25 years. I'm originally from Ontario, back east. Um, and I live in Vancouver with my husband and two boys. And they're now teenagers. So um, one is 18, and he's actually in his first year at college at the University of Victoria. And uh, my younger son is 16 and a half and still in high school. He's currently in grade 11. So it's a lot of fun traveling with teenagers. That's a whole other podcast subject, I think. It's probably um, a good podcast subject, actually. It is. Oh, I, I love it. I love traveling with them as teenagers. I mean, it's always been wonderful traveling with them. We've been doing it since our eldest was five months old. But it's it's, it's a wonderful way to travel when they're older because they're so much more capable. They're helpful. They can do things on their own. They can be more independent and and contribute uh, a lot more to the whole travel experience. And especially if they've been traveling all their lives, then they're really good about it. You know, they're not fussy. They're not picky. They they go with the flow, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see. But yeah, we've been traveling with them since they were very wee, visiting parents back east and great grandparents in in Europe um, over the years. And uh, we've done lots of fun things with them. So. Yeah, now it's a bit different now that they're getting older, but still fun. Yeah, I think every every age there's benefits and of course there's challenges at every age, so um, yes. It is fun, but I'm as my girls are getting older, I definitely can see that it's nice to travel with older kids, so. It is. The the one thing that I think that's big a real difference is that uh they do need access to their, you know, electronic lifeline. <laughs> we try yeah. to, you know, mitigate that as best possible. But uh, but they do have to check in with their friends and, yeah. you know, their their social media lives uh, every day. Uh, uh, yeah, but that's the way of it. I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. So. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah. Cool. So you were going to talk oh. to us today about Canada? Yes. Um, I'm so excited to talk to you about Canada, my home, my homeland, my beloved uh, place of birth and where I've spent most of my life. It's a great destination for people to consider for 2017, in particular, than normal, because obviously it's a fabulous any time, any year. 2017 is significant to consider visiting Canada for an awful lot of reasons, not the least of which is, of course, Lonely Planet naming us as <laughs> numero uno destination for 2017, which was, you know, pretty cool, I would say, quite a coup, and for a, a whole variety of reasons, I'm going to talk about some of those too, but you know, they they highlighted a lot of the physical beauty and amazing geography and, you know, wonderful things to see. Mountains, lakes, rivers in Canada, of course, things we're famous for from that perspective. But next year is going to be a really unique year because we're celebrating our 150th birthday as a country. So across Canada, there's going to be literally thousands of celebrations and events happening all across the country, big cities, tiny villages you know, um, celebrating our 150th birthday. And everything actually kicks off on New Year's Eve of this year. So December 31st in 19 kind of urban areas like Vancouver and Toronto, Montreal, there's going to be massive kind of kickoff celebrations on New Year's Eve. And then that's going to basically kind of get the party started for the entire year. Our national holiday is July the 1st. Um, which is our big, you know, Canada Day celebration. So Ottawa will be the place to be as our nation's capital for a lot of the parties and festivities that will be going on. Uh, that'll be a really big party uh, to consider. Another wonderful reason for visiting Canada in 2017 is the fact that Montreal in Quebec is celebrating its own anniversary. It's going to be celebrating 375 years since its founding as a city as one of the very first cities in North America founded by the French way back when. 
and they've been planning their own citywide celebrations um, for their own birthday. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's already a busy place, Montreal. Tons of festivals just for laughs, jazz festivals. It's, I mean, they're just going to, you know, ratchet it up a, a few notches to make it even more fantastic, which if you've ever been to Montreal, it's already amazing. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like next year as a party city. Yeah, when I went to Montreal the last time, it, uh, there was a food truck festival going on, which was so <laughs> fun. It was like fun. kind of food trucks and music. But and at the same time, they were setting up for some kind of, I think it was like some kind of Red Bull thing, but it was basically like people created these little um, like soapbox cars and they were, oh, yes, they were like going through mm-hmm. the city. So, yeah, <laughs> it was, yeah, the, you could tell that a city likes to party. And I was just in, I was just in Edmonton for my very first Canada day. And, you know, we spent the morning at the ledge is what it's called there, which is their legislative building because Edmonton's the capital of Alberta and had a big pancake breakfast and their, I want to say, I can't remember what it's called, premier, right? It was their premier. Uh, premier. Yeah. The premier was serving pancakes and it was pretty exciting. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, it's it's a big day. It's a big festival holiday. Yeah. Usually the weather's good. You know, it's kind of the kickoff yeah. of summer yeah, for us. Definitely. So I know Canada, um, you know, it's big, just like the United States. It's very diverse and everything. So can you give us a couple of ideas or what what are some possible itineraries or what are some pe- places people might want to go and visit if they want to hit Canada in 2017? Well, you're definitely right. It is big. Second largest country in the world. It's a it's a challenge to see it all at once. If you have a lot of time, you can definitely do it. It'll take you a long time. But one of the, the good things about it as well for 2017 is that if you do want to take time and go further afield, uh, if you're not going to drive across the country, you can, you know, hop, skip and jump with the plane is also the fact that our Canadian dollar is 30 cents lower than the American dollar. Mm-hmm. So it's as if Canada is like on sale for our lovely American friends and visitors. Mm-hmm. It's because the, the exchange rate is so favorable for people coming from the U.S., from Britain, from Europe. Um, basically, we're showcasing Canada at a discount. So if you want to extend your visit, you know, you're actually not going to be spending that much money when you come here because Canada is still a really affordable destination to visit. Our food is not that expensive, eating out accommodations, especially when you consider the the exchange discount. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that and, and should yeah. think about it because I also because yeah. I do trip planning for other families. Like I've gotten a lot of requests recently for people that are looking for Zika free, you know, destinations. Yes. They're worried yes. about terrorism in some places. And then, of course, the cost. And so you guys really kind of have it all when it comes to avoiding some of those hot issues, you know. Well, I mean, so much is, you know, beyond our control in terms of like geopolitical stuff. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, knock wood, Canada has been a very safe and stable place for a good long time. And we certainly hope it'll stay that way. And from the Zika thing, I mean, hopefully our cold winters will mean that that won't Mm -hmm. happen here, you know. But in terms of like where people can go, so much depends on where you're traveling from and what you want to see, how much time you've got um, and where you want to spend that time, right? Um, If you only have a week and you live on the East Coast, you want to max out your time. So you're probably looking at visiting uh, maybe Montreal, Quebec City, or some of the Atlantic provinces. Like Mm -hmm. you can do parts of Nova Scotia and then drive to PEI by the Confederation Bridge. It's only less than three Mm -hmm. drive. Yeah, right. You know, and what did you think? I loved it. I I can't wait to read Anne of Green Gables with my girls and take them to PEI. I loved it. So... It's also, it's been made into a musical. If you ever have a chance to see the Anne of Green Gables musical, it's really charming. Your girls would love it. Um, Lots of really nice songs. If your kids love musicals, of course. (laughs) But it's such a charming story. And yeah, on PEI, you can go to her home. I mean, you know, it's pretty, you know, fictional home, but still pretty spectacular. (laughs) Huge tourist attraction for people from all over the world who come specifically for that reason and then can also enjoy, you know, lobsters and potatoes and the beaches there, which are phenomenal. And then, you know, if you're out there, you know, you can visit lots of different things in Halifax as well. If you're looking more at um, a central uh, kind of holiday, depending on, on the type of timeline that you've got, then you can cover kind of the Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, kind of triumvirate pretty easily, especially if you've got like you know, more than a week, 10 days to two weeks, because the distances aren't all that bad. 
from Toronto to, to Niagara Falls. It's a two-hour drive. There's tons of things to see in between those places in Toronto itself. You have theme parks like Canada's Wonderland, the CN Tower, the Royal Ontario Museum, lots of other different museums. Um, Niagara Falls, of course, has the falls. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, lots of other fantastic destination things to see. Like They also have a, a huge Great Wolf Lodge, a 100,000 square foot water park in, in that particular Great Wolf, Great Wolf Lodge, which is massive. Sky rides and carnival games and that kind of thing as well. And then In that area is also Niagara-on-the-Lake, which is kind of its charming cousin with lots of little boutiques and ice cream shops and And wineries. Theaters and wineries, of course. (laughs) We did that that trip a couple years ago because, you know, I'm here in the Northeast, so it's easy drive. Not easy, but it was – it's a – kind of popular drive for us to do Niagara Falls. We did Niagara-on-the-Lake, which I just loved, and then we went up to Toronto and then drove up and stayed one night in the Thousand Islands area, which, oh, you know, okay. is kind of the the river, but, you know, that is separating the, the two. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's separating the U.S. and the and Canada there has, you know, so many little islands. And so it's a nice little kind of day cruise thing to do. And then we drove up to Montreal and then back down, you know, to the Boston area. So that was that was definitely a nice itinerary for like a week. Busy one. Absolutely. But, but oh, nice. yeah. Exactly. I mean, it is busy. It's not like a a beach holiday down south where you're kind of static. You're not moving around too much. Definitely, you're you're traveling from place to place and visiting different uh, attractions every single day. So I think you'd want to pace yourself depending on how much time you've got. In Ottawa, with the 150th birthday celebrations, I mean, it's going to be our biggest Canada Canada Day celebration on July the first. You know, all day half the night probably with bands and festivities and celebrities galore celebrating Canada on that day. There's going to be all kinds of other different museums having, um, you know, gratis openings to the public. Most of our national museums are located in Ottawa, like the National Gallery, the Museum of Civilization, the Royal Canadian Mint, if you want to see where money's made. I I personally find that really cool. (laughs) Who doesn't like money? (laughs) Um, And uh, during the winter, uh, you know, they have the Rideau Canal that's frozen, of course, every year. They'll be having uh, birthday celebrations on that in the wintertime. Uh, We have a special relationship with Holland because of uh, uh, World War II, and they've developed a signature Canada 150 tulip. uh, And they're going to be planting those in the spring, in May, 300,000 tulips that are specific to that. So, I mean, if you love flowers, then that's a place. so pretty. It would be absolutely brilliant. It would look just gorgeous. So, like I said, there's there's no shortage of, of things to do and see that can kind of pique every single person's interest, depending on, you know, how much time you've got. And then, of course, Montreal, 375th birthday celebrations all year long, a variety of different themes, the arts, which they're famous for, culture, food, outdoor fun. They're doing all kinds of different art, street art and uh, sculpture installations. Every little neighborhood in Montreal is going to have their own little celebration that's kind of pertains to their own kind of quirky culture themselves. You know, historical reproductions of what life was like 375 years ago. So I think I would definitely want to spend some time back in Montreal for that. I was actually born there way back when, um, but we (laughs) moved when I was quite young. So, um, you know, it's one thing to see it uh, as a child, but as an adult, it's a whole new experience. So nice. And then, then of course, the West. Well, my goodness, you know, love the West. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been out here, as I said, for almost 25 years, and I don't think I'm going to be going anywhere else. (laughs) The mountains, the ocean, uh, certainly in British Columbia, there's so many things to see here that are close um, to people living in California, Washington, Oregon, even Idaho, Montana. Um, To get here is is quite easy and cost-effective. And then you can kind of go and visit uh, all the different sites in Vancouver, lots of different museums, of course, too, but lots of, you know, beautiful physical things like the mountains and Whistler, all kinds of uh, great hiking, kayaking uh, in False Creek, going up Grouse Mountain if you want to attempt to do the Grouse Grind, which is quote unquote nature's stairmaster because it's quite grueling straight up the mountain. Um, but when you get there, they have they have all kinds of fun activities to do if you're not, you know, paralyzed from the walk up <laughs> <laughs> of the thousand steps you have to take. 
And then, of course, the Sea to Sky Corridor going up to Whistler and visiting Squamish. There's a variety of different attractions like the Sea to Sky Gondola, which is fairly new, um, which takes you up and overviews uh, how uh, fjord in how sound in Squamish. And then, of course, Whistler has a massive food and, um, you know, craft beer dining scene and then going up and doing hiking. And you can even ski on the glacier in the summertime in Whistler. And, of course, you know, skiing and snowboarding in the wintertime as well. And then if you want to hop over to Vancouver Island, it's only an hour and a half ferry ride. Total trip time of about three hours from Vancouver door to door to Victoria. But there's a, you know, the Vancouver Island is just filled with, again, a lot of wonderful wilderness adventures. You can go caving and spelunking and visit Bouchard Gardens and, you know, the ledge in Victoria too, because that's our provincial capital, so... Yeah, and we about, I remember we camped we camped on a beach kind of on the far edge, the far western side of Vancouver Island at one point and we also walked through a rainforest over there and yeah, Vancouver Island's gorgeous. It is. Yeah, we have Cathedral Grove which has, you know, 1000-year-old um fir trees, Douglas firs that uh that have been around an awfully long time and on that's the highway that's on the way to Tofino which is kind of the right. westernmost point that's accessible. And you you really feel that you are on the edge of the world because there's nothing between you and Japan except yeah. the Pacific Ocean mm-hmm. at that point. And, you know, the huge Long Beach there. And Tofino has a really great vibe. It can be quite busy in the summertime. The fall is a really great time to go. And then the winter storm season where you go and you're all cozy in your hotel or bed and breakfast and it's storm and rain is raging all around you. It's pretty spectacular. What about if people want to head up to like Banff and Lake Louise? Mm -hmm. Well, the great news again for visitors in 2017 is that all of Canada's national parks, and that includes Banff and Jasper and Yoho, are going to be free. So For the whole year? For the entire year, 2017. So you won't have to pay a park pass. It really well, went up in the, uh, the U.S. <laughs> National Park. There, yeah. Huh? <laughs> it's like not just fourth graders. Everyone gets in. Everybody. <laughs> Huge import for the majority of people who do visit Canada. Banff is like number one yeah. tourism destination on the list. And we visited there a couple years ago and camped because we love camping. And it is just such a beautiful beautiful physical place. I mean, the the Rocky Mountains there are just spectacular. There's all kinds of hiking and driving trips that you can do um, from Banff to visit uh, the Athabasca Glacier and Jasper National Park here on the Icefields Parkway, which is spectacular. Glaciers galore. And, you know, again, you're saving some money when you're not having to pay for the park entry. Um, You still have to pay to camp, of course, and make those reservations early if you want to camp or if you have an RV, because as soon as they open the government, uh, the Parks Canada reservation system, people are going to be reserving those campsites as soon as they become available. Canadians are avid campers. It is crazy out there. We do love our camping. Yeah. And when we went out there um, two summers ago, um, I was really blown away by, well, not just that all the campsites were full. That wasn't a surprise because, like you said, we do love our camping, but also the fact that there was such a wide variety of people going, like every nationality and all kinds of different ethnic groups camping and enjoying out the outdoor experience and big groups doing it kind of collectively, you know, like multifamilies. And I mean, it's just... It's just wonderful, whether you're doing it in an RV or in, you know, tents. There are a lot of different uh, camping options. Parks Canada even has some really cool new ways to camp for people who might be a little kind of, well, I've never camped before, that are equipped campsites that you do have to book ahead of time. You do have to reserve them, but they're kind of like in a yurt or in a little tent, and they come with kind of, you know, beds and pots and little uh, fire pit for people who may not have all of their gear already, you know, which as campers, you kind of accumulate over time. So there's those options as well. If you're not sure about tent camping, or maybe the kids may not enjoy it, you're not, you're not entirely, you know, certain about that, then you can reserve one of these special campsites in a lot of the national camp campgrounds across Canada and give it a try. Cool. Do you have any other um, like insider tips on visiting some of the attractions or money-saving tips uh, that maybe people don't know about? 
Well, we do. I think probably what a lot of people do is uh, try and determine our itinerary ahead of time, especially if you need to reserve campsites, then you need to know where you're going to stay. So you do have to put some time into trip planning Um, or that goes the same for hotels, too. So if you have travel points that you can utilize for hotel stays. I, you know, those are fantastic ways to save money. Um, buying tickets online for attractions ahead of time is great, especially if they're very busy places that have timed visits. If you know you're going to visit Niagara Falls and you want to do the Maid of the Mist, you know, you can book those tickets ahead of time for the day and time that works for you, as opposed to showing up and it being sold out, which would be really disappointing. We also pay attention to like Groupon type sites, living social um, for different areas and cities that we're going to visit. Um, you can just get email blasts uh, from those sites for the cities that you that are on your list. So you can kind of look at what might be coming up uh, as a as a deal for when you're going to go and get some uh, good deals accordingly. For things like Canada's Wonderland, which is a great theme park, it's our biggest one in in Canada. It's uh, north of Toronto. On our visits, every any time we've gone, we've either purchased them online or even more cheaply via Costco. If you're a Costco member. You can get tickets to a lot of major attractions, like in the U.S., also in Canada. So Canada's Wonderland, Marine Land, those types of things. And you can save a lot of money if you're going as a family. Those types of theme parks, you know, they add up. And if you want to bring, you know, pack your own lunch type of thing, I'm, I'm a big fan of that personally, too. So It probably makes sense, too, to check the, uh, the tourism websites. Because I remember last year in Montreal, they had a special, like, family package where if you booked at certain hotels – then you got admission into, you know, certain attractions and museums. So those kind of packages, I mean, you have to always look and see, yes. you know, how, how the math really adds up. But sometimes they can be a good deal, especially if it's being, you know, pushed not just by the a single hotel, but by the tourism board. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And like city passes for cities like Toronto, um, if you're going to visit multiple attractions as a family, not just the CN Tower, but maybe Ripley's Aquarium and the Science Center, it pays to get a city pass or, you know, a kind of an, an aggregate um, coupon, you know, book or right. pass system because you're going to save money um, and you're going to be able to visit a whole bunch of different things instead of, uh, you know, maybe having to be a little bit more careful about where you're going to go because it might, you know, the costs add up. Another thing, too, is also again, because 2017 is going to be such a special year for Canada, to visit the Government of Canada tourism website, Explore Canada, and the provincial ones of where you're planning to visit. So Hello BC for British Columbia. Um, I think it's Visit Ontario for Ontario. Um, Montreal 375, because they would have specific information, um, you know, like, hey, national parks are free, right? You're going to be saving money there. So I would definitely spend some time doing some online sleuthing in that way. Yeah, cool. So one of my things is always like, what are the must try foods wherever I go? Because I really like to eat local. And I know that we have, you know, on the East Coast or the Eastern, on the Eastern part of uh, Canada, you have things like poutine and um, (laughs) beaver tails or things like that. But, you know, can you, are there some kind of cross Canadian or is it more regional, but do you have some things that you think people should really try when they're visiting the different provinces? Well, yeah, it's, I would, that we have some fabulous regional foods. I don't know if there's any one particular food that is universal across Canada, apart from our love of Tim Horton's product, <laughs> <laughs> which varies across the land. In Ontario, it's ridiculously popular. I grew up in Ontario and they are on every street corner. They're not quite as common out here in British Columbia, but they're definitely around. Um, yeah, the, 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 the fanfare around Tim Horton's is, is, is real. Yep. <laughs> real. I love honey dip Timbits. Yeah, they're they're very good, <laughs> and of course the coffee. I would I would agree with you, Tamara, that it, it's really like you know the Atlantic, you know, lobster and potatoes and codfish pie in Newfoundland, and then Quebec, the poutine, which you mentioned, which is very popular with teenagers, as I have found, um, and, and you know, a meal all in one, except there's no vegetables, of course, although potato, I suppose, might count. Um, if, you know, Montreal also have bagels and smoked meat, too, and maple syrup, which is a personal mm-hmm. favorite of mine. 
Ontario kind of reigns supreme in the butter tart department, uh, which is, well, they're available all across Canada too, but I think Ontario kind of claims them as their own. In terms of sweet treats in British Columbia, we have our Nanaimo bars uh, named after the Mm -hmm. city of uh, Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. I have tried making them myself and they're a, a butter fest filled with butter and sugar and very delicious. And they're very unique to British Columbia, I would say, along with, of course, salmon. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Alberta beef. Yeah, Alberta beef. Alberta beef. It's I think it's everyone has a sticker on their car that's basically I heart Alberta beef yeah. on it. <laughs> that I see, all the time. I yeah, see I a few of those when you. I drive through Edmonton. <laughs> yes. I was going to well, ask you, like in the center, you know, we kind of skipped the center of the country, but the only things I, I think about when I think about you know, kind of the middle of Canada would be the Cal- the uh, Calgary Rodeo, mm-hmm. right? That's Calgary like a huge Stampede. thing. Like Stampede. Stampede. Calgary there you Stampede. go. Yeah. That's huge. Edmonton Mall. And of course, like one of the things on my list is going up to Churchill, you know, the Manitoba. in Manitoba. Yeah. 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 Polar bears. My yeah, husband wants absolutely. to do that badly. That's, that is huge. I mean, it's such a rare and um, bucket list type of experience to be able to do that. And really going up to Churchill is a lot more accessible in many ways than going all the way up to say Nunavut or Baffin Island in the far North to be able to see polar bears. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that would definitely be quite uh, a bucket list experience And the city of Winnipeg, where you'd be flying into, which is the capital of Manitoba is a phenomenal city. There's especially in the summertime, they have a long winter but they treat it really well. You know, they celebrate winter as much as any of our winter cities do because you have to be outside and, you know, enjoy the type of weather that you've got. You can't change it. So you may as well embrace winter, which they really do in Winnipeg with ice hockey and, you know, ice fishing and skating and, and all of those kinds of things. And, uh, historically there's been a large Ukrainian population Mm -hmm. in Manitoba and Winnipeg. So, you know, if you like pierogies, Pierogies You're going to find amazing pierogies in anywhere, in any town in Manitoba because of that influence of uh, people who came over from Ukraine many moons ago. In Canada, I've heard of it talked about as the mosaic. And so Canada really appreciates the ethnic diversity and each you know unique feature that those cultures bring to their country. <laughs> I I would agree with that. I mean, I'm the daughter of immigrants myself. I was born in Montreal, and for a lot of Canadians, that's pretty foreign, (laughs) being from Quebec. You know, so I mean, I I would say that, uh, I mean, the country has an official policy of multiculturalism, which I think has done it very well. And I think we're really proud of it as Canadians, because everyone, you know, unless you're First Nations, has come from elsewhere, whether it was yesterday or 150 years ago. You're from somewhere else. So I think that we are all Canadian, but we also have whatever our, our, you know, our background might, might have been from wherever our parents or grandparents may have come from whenever they did come to Canada. You know, but I think uh, it is nice to celebrate our, our differences at the same time as we come together as a country. And I think that'll really be reflected next year in the celebrations, because one of the themes that the, the, you know, federal government has put forward for the Canada 150 is to celebrate the multiculturalism aspects of Canada, as well as youth and also the First Nations, the importance of our um, Indigenous peoples, um, and to reconcile the relationship that we've had since Canada was formed as a country with the First Nations people. So there will be a lot of emphasis on Indigenous culture next year, which I think is really good because we talk about it a lot. If you've been to Vancouver Airport, it's nothing but incredible world-class First Mm -hmm. Nations art. Like it is a stunning airport Mm -hmm. to to arrive and to depart from. But I think we can do more as a country to really recognize the First Nations relationship and history that we've had and hasn't always been good. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I think there are big differences between, you know, the U.S. and Canada on many different levels. So, you know, in in saying to our wonderful American friends, hey, Canada, yeah, we speak the same language. We might sound the same, but we're very different in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so I know that, again, it's a huge country, but do you have a couple of favorite photo spots that families, if they're you know, maybe one or two spots on each coast or something like that, that families could take to capture a memory of a trip to Canada? Well, I do. Um, I've put some thought into it. And so I'm going to give you the kind of the photo lowdown from east to west. 
there there are many fabulous, of course, physical, beautiful spots, but some iconic places, you know, on the East Coast would be Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia. It's just a really picturesque, lovely little cove with a lighthouse, um, which makes for lovely photos and selfies. In uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, you have all the colorful little um, wooden houses in the downtown area mm-hmm. that make for a, just a lovely backdrop. You know, kind of think of that iconic street in San Francisco. You know, if you take a photo there, you'll know exactly where you were. You were in that street in St. John's type of thing. If you're visiting Anne of Green Gables house in PEI, I would definitely take a photo there as well. It's very iconic. Uh, in Quebec, the Chateau Frontenac uh, is an iconic hotel. Mm. Uh, and place to visit the Plains of Abraham there, the the war between the English and the French, uh, way back in Canada's history. Mm -hmm. Uh, Toronto, uh, the CN Tower, a great place to take photos too. Or if you're visiting um, Toronto Islands on Centre Island, there's a lot of lovely places in front of, uh, um, that showcase Lake Ontario behind you. uh, And you can do a backdrop of the actual, you know, downtown of Toronto from the island. It looks really pretty, actually, from there as well. I didn't mention earlier, but one of my favorite places in Alberta is um, Drumheller, Mm -hmm. which has the (laughs) Royal Terrell Museum. And we've driven out there when the kids were much younger. It was one of our favorite yeah, road trips as a family. And they have some fabulous dinosaur exhibits, including one outside the Royal Terrell Museum. And that makes a really nice backdrop with the kids as as a photo. If you go to the Badlands that are towards the Saskatchewan border, east of, uh, of Drumheller. The hoodoos, the hoodoos and the Badlands typography there, a great place for photography too, because it looks like an alien landscape, like you're on Mars. We have a family photo there that was on a Christmas card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, right? Yep. Right? yep. <laughs> and then, of course, I mean, Banff Jasper, the obligatory Lake Louise shots, the Moraine Lake, you know, backdrop with the, the mountains and, and the lakes there, uh, either of Lake Louise or Moraine Lake. And then if you go up towards Jasper and visit the Athabasca, Basque Glacier. They have the Glacier Skywalk now that you can um, visit, and uh, that is a, a paid tour. And you can go out on this kind of glass-bottomed skywalk and, and take a magnificent photo of the Athabasca Glacier behind you. We did that two summers ago. I could barely walk out onto that skywalk, though. It was terrifying. Because mm-hmm. you can look all the way down thousands of feet, and that's really kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> And then, of course, Vancouver, there's lots of beautiful places to take photos up on Grouse Mountain with the city behind you, Kitts Beach, where near I live, actually, with the downtown in the background. And then if you're out in Tofino, like you were on the west coast of Vancouver Island, you know, the wild beauty of the west coast, you know, that showcases uh, British Columbia at its best in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's some nice options. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's It's hard to do it all, though, in one trip. Yeah. That well, you know, there's there's, adventure. there's multiple seasons. I mean, I've been to yeah. Quebec City for their winter carnival and it was fantastic, you know, oh, freezing yeah. cold, but so much fun. And then obviously it seems like if you're going there in the summer, you should be there for Canada Day. And then, you know, there's so many wonderful things and places to do in the summer. And then, like you said, there's a lot of things that are really good in the fall, too. So yeah, it's like catch the one, trips. catch Highway 1 and just explore it all. <laughs> Exactly. Well, the fall, actually, I'm really glad you mentioned that because a great place to be in the fall is near Ottawa, Gatineau Park, or anywhere in Ontario, like going up to Algonquin Park to just to see the color show of the mm-hmm. trees. I mean, yeah. that's what I really miss the most about living on the West Coast is we just do not get that show. Um, and that's the, the thing I miss the most about Ontario, actually. <laughs> I would say that about Edmonton as well. Edmonton's a river valley city. And the fall, like if you can get there at late September, it is probably one of the most beautiful places to be because you've got the river valley. So there's good height and all the trees yes. growing on the sides. And it's a gorgeous it's stunning. city in the fall. Yeah. Stunning. Nice. Great. So our last question that we ask all of our guests, and we've seen you at some conferences, so we, we know a little bit about what you wear when you travel, but what, <laughs> you know, what do you like to wear when you travel? Do you have any favorite brands? I do. Yeah. Well, you know, I like to pack light. I, I travel with a carry-on, whether it's for a weekend conference or five weeks in Europe. So I pick my clothing really carefully for durability and kind of accessorizing 
because I don't like to pack a really big suitcase. I hate checking my baggage. So I like good quality clothes that that might be a little bit above price point, but they're going to last me, which is really what I need. So I have living on the West Coast, you need fleece and shells. So I do swear by my Arcteryx, which is a British Columbia brand mm. shell that that um, that keeps me cozy and warm pretty much three seasons. You know, and I wear it underneath a winter coat, too, in the wintertime for fourth season wear. Um, it also doubles kind of as an emergency pillow because it's kind of soft if I have to lay down somewhere and I don't have anything. Although I do have a travel pillow, of course, but <laughs> um, I also have a, a shawl, a pashmina shawl that's uh, from Kitten Ace, which is a, a brand that's from the same family that uh, created Lululemon. They specialize in technical cashmere, so it can be washed, and it's quite durable and long-lasting. So I have that with me every time I travel on a plane because I always find that I'm cold. And then I love my Birkenstock sandals for walking around, and they're kind of a little bit on the dressy side. So unless I need some height, which I I probably do because I'm not all that (laughs) tall. (laughs) I have these fabulous Tom's wedges that I picked up in Honolulu, which I adore. So I wear those to kind of fancify any outfit I have. And I love dresses. I find them really practical. Even when I'm hiking, I have like a skirt because I don't like wearing shorts. So I have a hiking skirt, which I absolutely adore. So, you know, I'll, I'll have that, which kind of doubles also as like a you know, a skirt to walk around town if I have to. But because we love hiking and camping and outdoor adventures, it's really practical to have that item, um, which I got actually from Eddie Bauer, fabulous, you know, American West Coast brand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have boots that I picked up in Italy when we were there a few years ago, which I swear by for uh, more kind of fall winter travel. And of course, I don't go anywhere without my eye shade and earplugs when I travel either for the plane or for sleeping. I need nice dark spaces. So I do consider that as part of my kind of um, (laughs) travel packages. Nice. Yeah. I will say you always look pretty fashionable for for, uh, traveling in a carry-on. So I think people have some, I must have something I can learn from you about packing. I think it's all about accessories, a couple of scarves, shawls, and some, you know, nice jewelry pieces and kind of mix it up a little bit usually helps. But um, it really depends on where you're going and where you're going to be spending time. Like if you're going to lots of fancy parties, that would be much more challenging, I think, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Or like Iceland in the winter. (laughs) You just definitely need some, some good layers. Yeah. Did you have like ski pants? You know, I brought ski pants, but once again, I did not need them. So this is the second time I've gone to Iceland and I did not need my ski pants because if you do outdoor um, activities that are like with uh, a tour operator, say you're doing like ATVs, snowmobiling, something like that, they actually provide you with like this full big like jumpsuit. So you're you're completely warm. Um, And they even had like loner gloves or socks and things like that, too, which, you know, that I don't know. I'm definitely not taking a loner hat. But, uh, <laughs> probably not I definitely pack either. my own hat. Yes, yes. I'm with you. I pack my own hats too. Although you don't but. call them hats in Canada. They're not called hats. What are they called? Beanies? Toques? Toques. I love yeah. it. Toques or beanies or, yeah, toques are back in fashion big time. Yeah. Lots of toque wear. Yep. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, Claudia, for all your lovely information about Canada. You did well on helping kind of give people a glimpse of how they could celebrate that great country and its special birthday. So if people want to see what you're up to in 2017, where can they find you? You can find me at thetravelingmom.ca and my wide variety of social media outlets as well, (laughs) Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And yeah, please uh, drop by my site and drop me a line if you have travel questions. I'm more than happy to help people out about Canada or anywhere else. And it's traveling with two L's. Yes, it is the Canadian spelling. Thank you for <laughs> pointing that out. <laughs> I just know I've had to, you know, do some searching for it. So I try to remember that. Great. Well, thank you. And I know that we obviously we recognize that we cannot really cover Canada in one episode. So there'll be more, you know, in specific areas or cities. But I think that this was a nice like overview, especially with all the celebrations happening in 2017. We just like really wanted to give people an overview of the wide variety of things there are. And with the Lonely Planet, naming it the best country for 2017. That's awesome. 
Well, yeah, let's piggyback on that. Yeah. And, and you're right. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to, you know, let people know that, you know, it should be on people's travel radar for 2017 in case they didn't know that, you know, that we're celebrating a, a big anniversary uh, for our country and that there are a lot of different neat things that are happening. And even if they have a week or if they have a month, there are a lot of different places they can visit and enjoy with their family. Very good. good. Well, thank Thanks you so again. much. Bye. Thank you, ladies. Bye. Bye. We're back this week with our app of the week. And since we've been talking about Canada, I thought I would name one of the apps that the Canada Border Services Agency puts out. And so it's called Can Border, C A N B O R D E R. And that app provides estimated wait times at ports of entry for Canada and the United States. So you'll find the wait times listed by port. You can also see like trends and historical data. And they even say they have like a trip planner function so you can generate an estimated best day and time and port of entry to be able to cross the border. And then they'll give you directions kind of to get you there. So it's a free service that's provided by the Canadian Border Services Agency and definitely would be helpful if you're planning to drive across the border because as Tamara said, and as I've seen going from Seattle, those border crossings can definitely easily add an hour or sometimes even longer if you're traveling during peak times onto your road trip travel time. So definitely check that out. All right. And I want to give a huge shout out to someone that left a wonderful review on iTunes. So thank you to Mama Landry. She says, I have just discovered your podcast and I'm loving it. This is a podcast niche that I find lacking, even though I want to soak up any and all info on family travel that I can get. Great job on that. The insights, tips, and variety in topics is perfect. Thank you so much because we felt the same way and that's why we started it. And uh, we've been having a lot of fun. So it's been, what, nine months now that we've been going? Yeah, I can't believe we're about ready to wrap out the year. And we had just started discussing it last year and now we're nine months in. So third, this is the, what, 39th, 40th episode that we've done, Tamara? Yeah, I'm so proud of that. Yeah. I, I think too. the average podcast, they say, lasts seven episodes. <gasps> Woohoo! We're way past that. Yeah. I think having you as my partner has definitely helped. Oh, goodness, yes. I could never do it on my own. No. Well, we are looking into next year and we're thinking about like what topics we're going to cover, what destinations we're going to cover. And we would love to hear your feedback, not just on that, but if you have anything else to add that we could be doing better um, or differently that you would like to hear, you know, more, more about our travels, less about our travels, you know, that kind of thing, please let us know. Let us know. I think you're also enjoying the apps and the tips because we are getting comments on those. Um, but if there is anything else that you are looking for or that you would like to see done a little differently, it's time for our new year's resolutions. So <laughs> yeah, we are open. Know. We are open to commentary. And you can email those to podcast at vacationmavens.com or just leave us a review, leave us a message on, on our Facebook page, on our Instagram account, Twitter, really, whatever, however you want to hit us up. Yep, definitely. Thanks so much for listening and for subscribing. It means a lot to us. And stay tuned next week. We're going to be talking about Chicago, which is something that also someone had requested. And we have a native, like, born and raised in Chicago that is going to give us her inside scoop on the best places, you know, to visit, where to eat, where to stay, all that kind of good stuff. Can't wait. Talk to you next week. Bye.